Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And you might already know, first I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. Now in today's part 44, we will talk about higher derivatives. Indeed, this is not a complicated topic at all, but it will be the groundwork we have to do to be able to talk about Taylor's theorem in the next video. The overall idea here is that the derivative of a function that is differentiable can be differentiable again. Hence, if we start with a differentiable function f, defined on a domain i, we get a new function we call f prime. Of course, it's not guaranteed at all that this new function is differentiable again. Actually, it's not even guaranteed that this function is continuous. Now, in the case that the derivative f prime is a continuous function, we call the original function f continuously differentiable. So this is simply a new property the function can have. And it's a stronger property than just being differentiable. And even stronger than this would be the case that the derivative is also differentiable. And then we call the function f simply two times differentiable. Again, this is just a property a function can have. Therefore, if the function has this property, we get the derivative of the derivative, so f prime prime. And usually one denotes that without the parentheses. Now you might already see, we can go even further and looking at 3 times differentiable, 4 times differentiable and so on. Therefore, for higher derivatives, you wouldn't use the primes anymore. But we would use an upper index where we put the corresponding number in parentheses. Okay, then I would say, let's define the higher derivatives in an inductive way. And of course, we should put it into a formal definition. So let's fix a function f again, which maybe is differentiable, but we don't need it yet. However, here we need a new notation where we have the function f with an upper index with 0. Hence, this means no derivative at all, so this is the original function f. Of course, this seems totally unnecessary, but it makes everything we write down now simpler. You see this immediately because now we define for every natural number n the term n times differentiable. In order to do this, we need to define the nth derivative. And you see, we immediately get the definition inductively. Which means by starting with the zeroth derivative, we get all the other ones. Then, of course, we call the function f n times differentiable if the nth derivative exists. So you see, this is indeed the same thing we have done before. Or in other words, inductively it means the n minus 1th derivative is differentiable. Okay, then the next step would be to generalize the term that f is continuously differentiable. Hence, now we would say that f is n times continuously differentiable. And of course, it just means that the nth derivative, which should exist, is also continuous. Okay, so you see, all of this is not so complicated. However, I should add that there are also other notations for the nth derivative. For example, one has a so-called Leibniz notation. And this one is given as a formal fraction. So one would write dnf divided by dxn. So it's as for the first derivative, but now this d gets an n and the x gets an n. Hence, the advantage of this notation is that you can fix a variable name if you need it. And in the same way, some people write this as an operator that acts on the function f. Of course, there might be also other notations, but these are the most common ones. Namely, you often see the term that a function is infinitely many times differentiable. However, more precisely, one better should say arbitrarily often differentiable simply because we want that the nth derivative exists no matter which n we choose. In this case we see immediately that all the derivatives also need to be continuous. Hence here the function is continuously differentiable as many times as you want. Ok, then in the next step I can introduce you to some important notations for sets of functions. Indeed, in analysis we often have a capital C with a domain i. And this represents the set of all functions f defined on the interval i with the property 
that f is a continuous function. Now it's not so surprising that we also have a c with an upper index n. And this one should include all n times continuously differentiable functions. So we write c to the power n of i which contains all the functions f with the property that f is n times continuously differentiable. And of course we use this definition for all natural numbers n. However, we also use it for the symbol infinity. Hence C infinity stands for the set of all the functions that are arbitrarily often differentiable. And as before, we use the symbol infinity as a shortcut for this. Okay, by having these definitions, we immediately get a nice inclusion chain for the sets. With this I mean that C of i is a superset of C1 of i. Moreover, C1 of i is then a superset of C2 of i. This should be clear because a function that is 2 times differentiable is also 1 times differentiable. Okay, and then obviously this whole relation continues with increasing natural number n. So you see we have a lot of subsets relations. And indeed at the end of the chain we find c infinity. Now this nice ordering we have for the sets you really should remember. For example, in the case that the whole real number line is our domain i, we can consider the function f of x given as x squared. You know, this function is continuous, so it lies in c i. Also you see, it's differentiable, so it lies in c1. It's also 2 times differentiable, so in c2. Indeed, it lies in c infinity. At some point, the higher derivatives will be just the zero function. Which is no problem at all, because we only need that the derivatives exist. Therefore we can conclude that all polynomials lie in C infinity. And consequently also in all the other sets here. Now another C infinity function you already know would be the exponential function. Since the derivative is the function again, it's clearly as often differentiable as you want. Okay. Then let me show you how we can use the higher derivatives with the next proposition. This is something you might have already applied, but now I also want to prove it here. The claim is that for a function f defined on an interval, we find a sufficient condition for a local maximum and minimum. We already know for a differentiable function, we have a necessary condition for having a local maximum or a minimum at an inner point of the interval. Namely, we have proven that the local extremum at x0 implies that f prime of x0 is 0. In other words, if the derivative does not vanish, we cannot have a local maximum or minimum at the point x0. For this reason, we need to use this property as an assumption. However, then we are also able to use the boundary points of the interval. Okay, now only one assumption is missing here we also need the second derivative at the point x0. So we assume that f prime is at least differentiable at one point, which should be x0. In other words, this means that f prime prime of x0 exists. Now we have two interesting cases, depending on the sign f prime prime has at x0. If it's positive, then this is sufficient for having a local minimum. Hence, this implies that the original function f has a local minimum at the point x0. Now, probably, this is something you might have already used in your mathematical career. If not, I think it will happen soon. Okay, now of course we also have the other sign, which gives us a sufficient condition for a local maximum at x0. So we have this implication you also should remember. Okay. Now I think you are interested in the proof of this. Therefore, let's do it immediately. However, we only have to prove one of the two parts, because the proof of the other one looks very very similar then. Hence, let's assume that f prime of x0 is positive. I write it in this way, because then on the right hand side here, we can use the definition of f prime prime, which is the differential quotient of f prime. So we have the limit x to x0 of f prime of x minus f prime of x0 divided by x minus x0. Now you surely remember that we used the symbol delta for this expression here. 
And by using this notation, the meaning of differentiability at the point x0 was simply given by the continuity of this function at the point x0. So in summary, we have a continuous function that is positive at the point x0. Hence, we can conclude there is a whole neighborhood of the point x0 where the function is positive. So let's simply call this neighborhood u as a subset of the interval a, b. And then we know the value of the function in this neighborhood is also positive. Okay, now we can use that this delta function here is given as the difference quotient and that we know f prime of x0 vanishes. Hence, here we find exactly two cases. In order to see this, let's remove our f prime of x0 and then we have a nice fraction here, which is, as we know, positive. So either the numerator and the denominator are positive or they are both negative. Other things we cannot have. Now because x comes from the neighborhood u, we are either on the left hand side of x0 or on the right hand side. If we are on the left hand side, the denominator is negative and therefore f prime of x has to be negative as well. Okay, and then of course on the right hand side we find the positive sign. So you see, we got some important information about f prime. And this one we can use to get information for the original function f. Namely, you should recall the sign of the derivative says something about the monotonicity of the function f. In short, a negative sign implies that f is decreasing and a positive sign implies that f is increasing. Therefore, this whole thing means on the left hand side the function goes down and on the right hand side the function goes up. Which is by definition saying that f has a local minimum at the point x0. Or in other words, the proof here is finished. And now you should have no problems at all writing down the same thing for b. Okay, with all this I think you now know a lot about higher derivatives. And therefore we can start with Taylor's formula in the next video. So I really hope I see you there. Bye!